we've pulled three clips from the TED Talk given by Stephanie Kelton, who is kind of the high priestess of MMT. She's she's an economist. She's written multiple books about it. She was an advisor to uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign at, at some point. Um, and I want to play some of these uh, clips from her talk just to introduce our audience to the concepts uh, behind MMT and, and have you sort of give your answer to those concepts. But before we roll it, I'll just mention that, you know, Bob has written lengthy articles, done very long podcasts on the subject. So uh, we, we'll link all of that as well if you want to go, you know, even deeper into understanding what this conflict is all about. But this will be a good introduction to MMT. So let's roll that first clip, John, where she talks about why deficits just don't even matter at all. Deficits have gotten a bad rap. They're almost always seen in a negative light. And I would like to change that. There's another way to think about government deficits. Just as a six becomes a nine when we view it from a different angle, a government deficit becomes a financial surplus when we look at it from another perspective. A deficit hawk might look at this picture and see nothing but a sea of worrying red ink. That's not how I look at it. Here's what I see. I see what's happening on the other side of the government's ledger. When the government spends more than it taxes away from us, it makes a financial contribution to some other part of the economy. Their red ink is our black ink. Being responsible shouldn't mean running the government's finances like a household. Instead of trying to keep the deficit in check, Congress should be focused on keeping inflation in check. That's the real limit on spending. And it's the thing to watch out for Okay, so just like, you know, you turn your head and a six becomes a nine, you flip this graph around and one man's deficit is another one's surplus. What is wrong with that general analysis, Bob? Okay, so yeah, I'll try to be, be succinct here. So one way I, I, I try to get this across is just to say, in her just that analogy or that, that particular statement, there was nothing special about the U.S. government. You could likewise just say, you know, people, the shareholders of a certain... Google or whatever are worried if, if Google runs issues more bonds. But if you think about it, you know, someone in the private sector, you know, owning a bond issued by Google, that's, you know, an asset to them. And so really, as the deeper Google goes into debt, the wealthier planet Earth minus Google becomes. Mm -hmm. And so really, we should all be, you know, cheering every time we see a particular corporation issue more bonds because that's asset. And you wouldn't, you know, normally talk like they say, yeah, I guess that's true. But, you know, that's that's not the way we talk. So there's nothing special about the government. And then what's interesting is if you push it and say, no, no, but really the federal government is is different from private companies in, in many respects. It makes the case worse on their part because. Right. So right now, the you know federal government owes the, the public, what, 20, 28 trillion dollars all told and, you know, including the federal right. or whatever. OK. So should the rest of us view that as a, as net assets and like, oh, this is great given all the land and buildings and brain surge, all these other assets that we have on top of that, there's this U S government that owes us 20, but it's 28 trillion. How are they going to come up with that to pay it to us there? If they tax it, they're sticking guns at us saying, give us that money or we're going to throw you in a cage. Right. So that's not clear that I should view that as an ad that the, the private sector's whole should view that as a net asset or they're going to print money. And again, so here we get into our different economic views, but in general, the U.S. government creating $100 bills is not making planet Earth $100 wealthier with each bill they print, I would argue, right? And so that's, I mean, it's a, if a mugger, you know, some guy owes you $1,000, he sticks a gun in your belly, says, give me $1,000, you get, hand him the 1000 and then he hands it right back to you and says, now we're square. If that's what you thought his debt to you was, you wouldn't be walking around thinking this is a $1,000 asset if you knew the way he was going to pay you back was to take it from you through force. So again, the fact that the U.S. government, in a sense, owes the rest of planet Earth twenty-eight trillion or whatever, that doesn't mean the rest of planet Earth is twenty-eight trillion dollars wealthier. If the U.S. government just disappeared on that score alone, it's not that the rest of planet Earth was oh now we're we're that much poorer. 
There's also something very telling, I think, about the way she finishes that little chunk of the TED Talk talking about how, like, well, inflation is really the thing that we ought to be concerned about here. And it's like, well, what is the means by which you will be able to pull off that amount of government spending without creating infl- rapid inflation? Right. Like that that feels a little bit unanswered or underexplored. I mean, I would imagine she goes into more detail later, but like, you know, that's a risk that you run. And I feel like the last few years have been a great case study in sort of discrediting a lot of the MMT hypothesis. What do you think of that? Like, is MMT basically discredited now? <laughs> I mean, so I certainly I, I think it's done poorly. Now, I hear the different MMTers said different things. But Stephanie Kelton, since we're talking about her, mm-hmm. she was definitely doing talk shows, you know, like like, you know, CNBC, those types of interviews uh, is in like 20 you give me time, like 2022, you remember when, when price yeah. inflation really started picking up and some people were worried and then others were like Krugman were saying, oh no, it's transitory. Don't worry. It's just supply okay. side bottlenecks. Don't worry. We don't, we don't want the Fed to tighten too aggressively. And so Kelton definitely was doing those shows saying this is transitory. Don't, don't worry. So she was clearly wrong at the, you know, in real time, misdiagnosing how bad it was going to get. And then, you know, we had the highest price consumer price inflation since the late seventies, early eighties. And they were, I have never seen any MMT person saying, okay, yeah, we did overdo it there, but we're just saying as a general rule, these right wingers are still, you know, gold bug orthodox fuddy duddies. I didn't see anyone saying that. So, you know, it made, yeah. it was understandable in, you know, 2016 when price inflation by normal metrics was low and interest rates were low, that the yeah. MMTers were running victory laps saying, aha, guys like Peter Schiff, and if they knew me, Murphy, were <laughs> raising false alarms. But, as of 2022, 2023, it was the mirror image where a lot of MMTers and conventional Keynesians also had been saying, don't worry, folks, the Fed's got it under control. And they were wrong. And inflation ended up being a much bigger deal than they had been leading them to believe. Yeah. Okay. And just to give the fuller context on this TED Talk, this was in October 2021. And so she's giving this in the context of we just did all this p- pandemic spending and look how great it worked out. We just need to keep we need to keep doing that. Like the pandemic, at least that initial round of pandemic spending in her mind, that proved the premises of MMT. And we just need to like step on the gas at this point. So like in her mind, what was the, the Bidenomics approach was, uh, you know, the right direction, but not fat, not fast and hard enough, I guess. Uh, I, I want to talk more about the um, the issue you were raising there, Liz, though, with um, inflation and uh, money printing, because in this next one, she explains why having a fiat currency, which is not backed by gold or anything like that, changes the equation and makes it so you, you have a lot more flexibility to uh, embark on the kind of policies she would like to see. So let's play that and get Bob's explanation and reaction. MMT provides an accurate description of how a fiat currency like the U.S. dollar or the British pound actually works. It reminds us that we're no longer on a gold standard, so finding the money to pay for the things we need is never an issue for countries like the U.S. or the U.K., As the issuer of the currency, the federal government can never run out of money. It can afford to buy whatever is available and for sale in its own currency. Now, that might mean spending on roads and bridges, a military arsenal, or hospitals and schools. Finding the votes to pass a spending bill can be hard. But finding the money is never a problem. They just create it. Everything's done electronically, so there's no physical printing of money involved. If you got a $1,400 check from the federal government earlier this year, or if your company received money to help cover payroll and other expenses, then you received some of the newly minted digital dollars that were created to support our economy. No taxpayers were involved in that process. It was all done using nothing more than a computer keyboard. So is she right that thinking of government spending as using taxpayer dollars to fund things is somehow outdated? 
well, she's not. Okay, so there, like the, the fundamental point she was hitting, and, and the name of the documentary, the, the, the pro MMT documentary that basically followed Stephanie Kelton around the country, was called Finding the Money for that reason, right? So the, their right. central insight is that, hey, in these political battles, when we're worried about should we have single payer health care or a Green New Deal or putting you know bases on Mars, let's stop saying, how can we pay for it or can we afford this or where will we get the money? Let's just say instead, is this going to cause too much? price inflation like or do we want to divert real resources into these ends and so on that narrow point yes that's true but when it's not that people thought oh literally we had no idea that they could just print money we, we had no idea right that i mean this like murray rothbard's you know a, a great author in the austrian tradition his book mad economy and state that came out in the early 1960s he had and this wasn't something he invented this was standard among free market economists to say there's three ways the government can pay for something either through taxation, borrowing, or printing money, or, you know, it's, it's inflation, which is basically, a, you know, a, a hidden tax, mm-hmm. right? Where, where, you know, they say outright taxation, borrowing, which is like deferred taxation, or inflation, which is hidden taxation, right? That's the way it's talking about. So everybody has known for a long time that the government can, quote, pay for something through creating more money. And the issue mm-hmm. is just that doesn't make it free, that just makes it harder for the public to understand what's going on. And so it's kind of deceptive. So they're just, you're saying that she's actually acting as this, as if, as if, as though this is some sort of new insight that is uh, like historically governments have done this for it, decades, right. if not longer. Um, and, you know, can right I use now, my favorite, the way- Can I use my favorite analogy, Zach? Yeah. The, real fast. So- it, people, the, if you're an Austrian type, you're going to think this is funny. If you're an MMT or you think this is the stupidest thing ever. But so the analogy I use is like, imagine if you have a, a husband and wife sitting at the dinner table and always in these stories, the husband's the buffoon and the wife is the, the shrewd one. And they're arguing over their budget. And the wife's saying, I just don't, we can't afford this. We got to stop going out to eat so much, given what our respective it, uh, salaries are. We just, we can't. And the husband says, no, 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 stop talking like that. We don't have a budget constraint. I can just put a ski mask on, take off the shotgun and go down to 7-Eleven and rob them. Now, it's true. I'm not saying that's a panacea. I eventually might go to prison, but let's stop talking about we don't have much money. Of course we do. I can just go rob us. You see what I mean? So right. The question yeah. is, <laughs> did the husband just help the conversation? And did he really, you know, is, was it good that he corrected his wife who kept right. erroneously saying we don't have the money to afford going to, you know, Disneyland yeah. this year? No, that's goofy. So likewise, when people are saying, how are we going to pay for the Green New Deal? They mean it's going to be, you know, if we divert resources there, the public doesn't want us doing that. Yeah. That's not in our national interest. They don't mean literally how could we come up with enough hundred dollar bills to pay for that. Yeah. <laughs> but if I can get to what I think she's, uh, you, I think that's a very important and valid point because um, the, it, it's almost like wrapping this really s- simple statement in s- this, as some sort of profound insight when really... What she seems to be saying is that this is what the government should be doing. Not like I discuss. It's not really like she discovered that the government can print money. It's like I think the government should just print money to pay for these things, because right now we we talk about the government printing money, or as she points out, you know, just adding to the digital ledger money. But it's not as though that's exactly how it works. I mean, the government first, and you can correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but the government first borrows money by issuing treasury bonds, which then people buy to lend the government money. And then there's a process whereby the Federal Reserve can work with the treasury to create money. But there's this it, there's this whole series of steps that have to take place before just printing money. And and that seemed to be like at the center of that of the MMT documentary is like, well, why don't we just print the money and not go through the whole, you know, borrowing charade? What is your answer to that? Why shouldn't or why doesn't the government just print the money? Okay, yeah. So I'll answer this in, in stage. So you're right. In, in terms of like the hyper technical point, that's what's so ironic about this is the MMTers will often retreat and say, this is just accounting guy. We're just telling you how the world is. We're not recommending anything. It's just you guys don't even know how the world works. And no, if you like read Stephanie Kelton's book, for example, and you're right, it parts in that MMT documentary, they at least were very misleading. She says things in her writings about like, oh, when the if the government wants another, you know, 100 fighter jets, the Treasury just instructs the Fed to credit the account of Lockheed Martin or whoever. But by this amount, and no, yeah. that's not true. By by statute, 
the 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 treasury cannot over you know they they can't bounce a check as it were, or they can't spend more than's in their account with the Fed. Okay, yeah. just like you know, I I can't instruct Bank of America to pay the grocery store more than's in my checking account. Okay, yeah. so I don't spend a ton of time dwelling on that because that is just a you know they they could a Congress could change that tomorrow if they wanted yeah. to. So I don't want to make it, but I'm just saying. Even yeah. on their own terms, if we're just explaining how the world works. It's actually not quite right. What well, yeah, you said, that's how right. it works. But First, it seems like yeah. that's how they want. That's how they want it to work, though. Right. So I mean, so what? I mean, it's kind of a shell game. So what happens in practice is the Treasury, yes, officially issues new debt, you know, new bonds. The P, the primary dealers, you know, give them the money, and then the Fed may end up buying a lot of that from them in the secondary market, creating new money that way. So it's kind of a shell game to the extent that. If the Fed's balance sheet goes up by the exact amount of the deficit, you can say indirectly the Fed monetized the debt. But strictly speaking, the way Kelvin her writings talks about how it works is not correct. But then more generally, if you're saying, uh, you know, sh- should they go through that charade? Like, wouldn't it just be more straightforward if when the government wants to spend more than it wants to tax in a given period, should it just create the money for, you know, right out of the gate rather than going through all the stuff about issuing bonds and the Fed monetized it? It's one could be up to there's two schools of thought on that. So one hand is just like that might open up the floodgates even more. And maybe you're concerned about doing that. But on the other hand, it might be more transparent. Right. So I actually know some right wing Austrian hard money types who say, yeah, as much as I don't like, yeah. you know, I don't want to give uh, Nancy Pelosi the printing press any more than I want to give it to, uh, you know, uh, Powell still when in, when prices go up at the grocery store, if you could show, well, this is because Congress is spending all that you know money, like it might be easier oh, to pin the blame on an accelerationist uh, uh, approach to it, huh? Right. Like so, so, yeah. so yeah, I'm not here. Money like, printer go burr so people know what yeah. happens. There's, yeah. there's I like ways. the chaos of that. There's something fun. <laughs> I do not of... like the chaos of that. <laughs> there's something richly satisfying about attempting to connect consequences in a more transparent way, right? Yeah. Are you are you willing to uh, go out with wheelbarrows full of currency to experience that uh, thrill? Uh, <laughs> well, let's talk about inflation because there's one more Kelton clip I want to play that addresses the inflation aspect, which she mentioned in the first one. Um, in this last one, she says that the only constraint, the only real constraint to government spending is how many actual resources are available in the economy. John, could you roll that clip? Congress should be asking, how will we resource it? To answer that question, think of people, factories, equipment, and raw materials like wood and iron. If we're going to build high-speed rail, fix crumbling infrastructure, and green our economy, then we'll need concrete, steel, and lumber. We'll need construction workers, architects, and engineers. We'll need companies that can fill thousands of orders for solar panels, EV charging stations, and electric school buses. In a full employment economy, all of the resources you need are, well, fully employed. There's no spare capacity anywhere in the system. So if the government suddenly tried to make all of these investments at once, it would quickly discover that it doesn't have the people or the building materials to do the work. To get the resources it needs, it would have to compete with the private sector, bidding up wages and prices. That would be inflationary, and it would be fiscally irresponsible. We are a long way from full employment. We have the resources we need to begin repairing our broken systems, but we have to believe it's possible. So in this theory, then the only real check on government spending is whether or not the there's full employment in the economy, because then you're competing with the private sector and causing price inflation by the increased competition. What do you make of that now that plank of MMT? Right. So again, though, that by itself, that doesn't justify resorting to the printing press, right? You could just say in general, yeah, to tax more or borrow more and, and spend and then government. Yeah. If, if there's this, a depressed economy, the government can issue a bunch of debt and, and spend that way, like a conventional Keynesian. 
And so yeah. again, even on, narrowly on its own terms, I don't think that that's justifying, you know, resorting to the printing press so much, but more generally in terms of like just basic disagreement about how the world works and how the economy works, her viewpoint would make sense or the you know, standard Keynesian view like a Paul Krugman would make sense if you thought the free market or the market economy, let's just say, left to its own devices could get stuck in a rut where for years at a time, resources remain idle. But at least in the Austrian view, the, the reason we have these boom bust cycles and you do have periods where unemployment is high is because of a prior inflationary boom, right? So it's not just the market on its own gets stuck in a rut. It's because of prior government intervention. And so re really, even if it were the case that oh, yeah, right now there's a bunch of workers at home and they can't find work, you don't fix that by saying, let's have the government come and just make up a bunch of jobs and direct them. I and mean, that's that's central planning. Just no, let the market sort that out and then the workers will get placed in a more sustainable long run niche rather than having somebody like Stephanie Kelton working with other people saying, well, we could just take some steel and some con concrete and some construction workers and we could go do this and green the economy. I mean, ultimately, you have to rely on prices to coordinate all of that and having just a bunch of people in Washington coming up with grandiose projects that you're, you're trying to mix two things together that don't really mesh. Hope you enjoyed that clip from Just Asking Questions. You can watch another one here or the full episode there. We have an audio version of the podcast, which you can subscribe to using the link in the description and subscribe to Reason TV for notifications when these episodes go up every Thursday. Hope to see you then.